What's up Crossbridge family? My name is Daniel Gonzalez and this is my friend Morgan Gallion and as you probably can notice we are wearing some uh, Christmas decor. I don't know what you <laughs> yes, call this. Christmas outfit. Outfit. Yes. Okay. And it's because we had Ugly Christmas this past Wednesday out of Blaze and it was so awesome. We played games. That is true. We played musical chairs which is always a win. That's we just great. had a really awesome time. So Dan and I are still in. Our and ugly some of the Christmas. students dressed up in the like funniest Christmas sweaters they and did. like reindeer on them and all kinds yeah, of Yeah, it was super stuff. awesome. Awesome. But one way, well, we're just really excited for Christmas and yeah. Dan has a way that you guys can get involved this Christmas. Yeah, so this is the last week that we are continuing to partner with SA Heels and doing their affordable Christmas program and that's ending on Wednesday. So be sure and visit the website so that you can donate to that and provide for families who are less fortunate this year and not able to afford that. So we could jump in, be the church and serve people in that way. Christmas Eve is so close and I'm yeah. so excited, but we wanna remind you of our Christmas Eve service times. We have one at 3 p.m., 4.30 p.m., and 6 p.m., and our 3 and 4.30 p.m. are for our families. So we'll have costumes for your kids, we'll still do our live nativity. Your kids don't have to go on stage if they don't feel comfortable, um, but we're just really excited to celebrate Christmas with you guys. And then our 6 p.m. service will be our candlelight service. It's gonna be a really sweet time. Yeah, we're really looking forward to it. And today we're continuing our encounter series and today Pastor Kirk Freeman is going to be talking about the life of Nicodemus and what it looks like to be included in what God is doing so be sure and tune into it ask the Lord what he has to speak to you through this message I know it's going to be encouraging to you so let's stand and worship together morning Crossridge. It is such a good day to worship the Lord. There is joy in this house. If you're watching online, there is joy in your house. And we are so excited to just look at Jesus and adore him in everything that he does. And so Jesus, would you come and fill our hearts? We make room for you. Would joy break out in this room? Would your light fill every space? We are here for you. Come and do what only you can do, Jesus. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing.
Yeah, the wonder of your love, Jesus. We step into agreement with that. The wonder of your love. So we step into your love right now. We step into that truth that, Lord, you are all we need. You are our all-sufficient sacrifice. And so, Jesus, we come humbly before you. We ask for more of your spirit, more of your presence. Would your first love invade our hearts in this moment? All depression has to flee, all anxiety has to go and bow at the name of Jesus who is our first love. For joy comes in the morning. New mercies are every morning. We come under that agreement and in that authority that we are your children full of your love. Sing, I'm returning. I'm returning to the secret place, just an altar and a flame. Love is found here in our sacred space. I hear your voice, I see your face. Your
Yeah, we're gonna keep singing that. We're gonna step into that. He loves us. Oh. Lord, you love us. Your heart for us is great. You walk in the room and you see every need, every hurt, every distraction, and you say, no, come bring it to me. I have you. So King of glory, we look at you. We fix our eyes on you. We adore you, mighty God, wonderful and wise in counsel, mighty God. We look at you. Mm, wonderful. Wonderful and wise in counsel, forever mighty God. Precious Father, everlasting, blessed Prince of Peace. Glory kings of earth rest on your shoulders you rule on david's throne your kingdom here is now established christ our lord of lords Thank you, Jesus, that you're here in this place. And I just want you to take a moment and think about that. God with us. That the very reason Jesus came was so that we, 2,000 years later, could say that. That he's with us. 
that his presence is real and he's here in this place. And so I just wanna ask you, invite you into this moment to close your eyes and just say thank you to Jesus for dying on the cross, for being here, that, that you could say he's with us. And just in your own words, say thank you to him. And maybe if you're struggling in that right now, you're, your mind is wondering and you have all, those thought, all these thoughts, maybe think about the ways in which you need him to meet you this week. I was up early this morning praying for somebody depression's on your mind and you need him to meet you in the middle of your depression this week. Anxiety, fear, worry about finances. Maybe as you have your hands held out, just, just bring your needs before the feet of Jesus and say, I need you to meet me. Meet me right here in the middle of, of this situation, Jesus. Thank you that you died. You came and you died so I could say that in advance that you're gonna meet me. Just give it to him. God, we thank you for the, the truth of your word and that declaration. Emmanuel, God with us. And you didn't, you didn't just die and leave us alone. No, you sent the Holy Spirit. We welcome the Holy Spirit into this room to lead us and to guide us into moments of experiencing you, into moments of encountering you, into moments of releasing pain and anxiety and fear to you so that we may glorify your name. So Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and saving us from our sins. I pray over these people that I love, those here in the room and those gathered with us online. God, I pray that you, you would be very real in our midst today. The love that we've been singing about would wash over our hearts and our minds and once again, renew us, renew us. Show us what new birth looks like. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we believe. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Dillashaw, and I'm the student and family pastor. And it's just a joy to be with you in the house of the Lord, whether you're here on campus with us or you're gathered online. It's just really good to, to be in the presence of other believers and to love God corporately together. That's one of the ways in which we do that is through our worship. It's not the only way, but it's one of the ways that we, we love God is as we sing these praises to him. And on this third week of Advent, we're thinking about joy. And we're thinking about the over 300 prophecies that Jesus came to fulfill and how that just creates this stir in our hearts uh, to, shout for, to shout joy to the Lord. And Isaiah said it this way, he said, church, shout and sing for joy. O you inhabitants of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. And that's what we just got finished singing about. That's how we got finished loving God. We got to say, thank you that you are in our midst. And so today I want you just to be thinking about that joy and be able to think about somebody that you might be able to share that with. Um, you know, another thing that we always do as a church in every setting that we're in, but uh, on Sunday mornings, we, we wanna love people well. And one of the ways in which we do that in this corporate setting is we just pray for each other. And that's what we just got finished doing. And we'll do that again before the end of our time uh, together. But I also want you to know whether you're here on campus or joining us online, we have a team of people uh, that want to pray, want to, to, to be there, to minister to you, especially in this season, just as we are all supposed to be talking about happiness and joy, but maybe, they're, maybe you're not experiencing that. And so whether you're here on campus or joining us online, um, if you have a need and you would like somebody to pray for you, I wanna encourage you, take a step of boldness. You just don't have to sit there in silence on your own. No, text the word life to 77411. And we have a team of people that will reach out to you today and pray for you. We, we, it doesn't do any of us any good just to hold those things inside. And so one of the ways we love people well is just by praying for, for them. Another way in which we love people well is in and through our tithes and our offerings. And if you're here on campus today, you can give online in the box, or not online, in the box, or you can give online uh, virtually, whether you're here or online. Those instructions are on your screen. But I was thinking about a friend that I have in Southeast Asia, and we get to love people well when we give in and through our first gift offering. Uh, for those of you who are members of our faith family, you know that every uh, December, we give our first gift back to God. And all we do as a family is that we pray and obey. 
And in this season, uh, that's what we're asking. And, and so would you just kind of think about that? The, the website's on the screen and you can uh, go to there and you can look at the different uh, uh, international things and local things that we'll be doing with our first gift offering, offering this year. And I just wanna ask you to pray and obey um, and know that as you do that, you're getting to love people well and you're getting to help all of us contribute together to making disciples uh, throughout the nations. Um, and so that's gonna be exciting as we hear those stories in the future. Uh, well, I, I, as we continue our encounter series, I've been super pumped uh, to get to today because today is going to be amazing. In just a few minutes, you're gonna get to see John 3.16 come to life if you haven't seen it already. Uh, but we're, we're walking through seven different encounters that we see in the gospels, seven different real stories from real people. And we're doing that alongside the, the web-based chosen series, uh, or the web-based series, The Chosen. You could find next week's episode episode online, uh, but we're also hearing from seven different voices here on stage about their encounter. And so I'm excited that you're gonna get to see John 3, 16 come to life, but I'm also excited about the voice that you're gonna get to hear from today. Uh, our very own lead pastor, uh, Kirk Freeman, is gonna bring, be bringing the word this morning. And you know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter three to give honor where honor's due. And he always leads us in doing this for other people. Uh, and we rarely get to do it for him. He's sitting right over there. And so I would love it. If you're online, you can clap from home. If you're here in the room, let's show our pastor some love right quick and just appreciate him. This man loves us so well. Prays for you in ways you don't even know. Um, and he leads us with humility. And I, I am constantly amazed and blessed that I get to be a part of his life. And uh, in, in a second, you're gonna get to see that video and we'll pray for him first. But I wanna remind you that Sunday morning has its power in its context that we are people who are committed to go and make disciples. And so as you listen to Kirk today, I wanna challenge you to be thinking about somebody that you can share a story with. Uh, it may be from the message, it may be from something that we prayed about, it may be something in your week. But Sunday morning, really its power and its context is when we leave this place or you shut off that screen and you go and you tell the story, the greatness of the greatness and the goodness of our God. So as you listen, I wanna challenge you to do that. Would you extend a hand towards Pastor Kirk and let's pray a blessing over him. Jesus, we thank you that you came as a baby and you lived those 33 years and you died on the cross so that we could utter that phrase, you're with us, you are Emmanuel. You didn't cease to be that. And so God, as we take a deeper look at this story and it comes to life for us, I pray for my faith family, these people that I love. God, would the, the love, the eternal everlasting love of God wash over our hearts and our minds as we encounter you fresh again today. And would you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, stir in our hearts an affection for the lost that we may leave this place and share that story with someone else. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray and believe. Amen. I don't know where to start. I have so many questions. I... Shall we sit first? Oh, yes, of course. Eastern slums. Hmm. Many wandering preachers have succeeded in gathering crowds with their rhetoric and fiery tone. I've heard a few of them over the years myself. So you know the type. Mm -hmm. But I have never heard anyone tell a paralytic to get up and walk, much less it actually happened. So what is your conclusion? I believe you are not acting alone. No one can do these signs you do without having God in him. Only someone who has come from God. And how is that belief going over in the synagogue? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why we are here at this hour. What else? What have you come here to show us? A kingdom. That is what our rulers are worried about. No, not that kind. Then what? 
A sort of kingdom that a person cannot see unless he is born again. Born again? Yes. You mean, like, a new creature? A conversion from Gentile to Jewish? No. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Then what is born again? <sighs> I hope you don't mean return to the womb, because that would be a problem for me. My mother, may she rest in peace, is dead. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That part of you, that, is what must be reborn to new life. How can these things be? Ah, a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things. Huh? I'm trying, Rabbi. I know. I know. Do you hear this? What? Listen. What do you hear? The wind. How do you know it's the wind? Because I can feel it. I hear its sound. Do you know where it comes from? No. Do you know where it's going? No. That's what it is to be born again of the Spirit. The Spirit may work in a way that is a mystery to you. And while you cannot see the Spirit, you can recognize his effect. Mind is consumed with thoughts of what a stir these words would cause among the teachers of the law. Yes, and I do not expect otherwise. I speak of what I know and have seen, and it has not been received by the religious leaders. It is hard to receive. So if I have told you of earthly things, and you do not believe, how can I tell you heavenly things? I believe your words. I just fear you may not have a chance to speak many more of them before you are silenced. I have come to do more than speak words, Nicodemus. More miracles? Yes. But even more than that. But I did not come to deliver the people from Rome. Then from what? From sin. From spiritual death. God loves the world in this way. That he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So this has nothing to do with Rome. All about sin. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, Nicodemus. He sent him to save it through him. I, my whole life, I have wondered if I would see this day. I don't know if you've been, I hope, I so genuinely hope that you're watching the Chosen series with us each week. It just stirs my heart every time. I think the number one thing that I've gotten from it is to see this actor who's portraying Jesus. Just what he, he's, and every other time I've seen someone play Jesus in a, in a movie or a show, there's always this sort of otherworldly, floating above humanity kind of wisdom or aura about him. And, and, and there's no doubt that there's this wisdom of God and this somberness that comes from, from being God and knowing where Jesus is going. But there's also just this humanity that comes out that reminds me of who he is, that Jesus is a real person. And he always will be. He made an irrevocable decision to become human and yet still be God. And that's who we'll know him as. This is why I so want you to watch the series and I want you to watch it with your families if you have kids in your home. You know, what you saw here was Nicodemus coming to meet with Jesus. This is out of John chapter three. So if you are, if you have your phone or your Bible, open up them to John chapter three where we hear the history, John writing about the story of Nicodemus coming to meet with Jesus. Nicodemus is a Pharisee 
religious scholar, expert in the law. But not only that, the Pharisees were the chief adversaries of Jesus. They were constantly trying to trick him, trap him in some sort of theological, hypothetical situation to see if they could somehow accuse him of blasphemy. But Jesus saw through it every time and would confound them with his wisdom. And he didn't pull any punches with them. Matthew chapter 23, he, he lists seven woes to the Pharisees, calling them fools and blind guides and hypocrites. And Nicodemus is one of those guys. But more than that, Nicodemus is actually not just a Pharisee. He's one of 71 religious leaders that formed something called the Great Sanhedrin. Every Israelite town had a lesser Sanhedrin, which was like a theological civil court where the Jews could come and have their complaints and offenses heard or tried. They, Israel was occupied by the Romans, but Romans allowed the Sanhedrin a measure of autonomy as long as peace was kept and taxes were paid. But in Jerusalem, there was the great Sanhedrin. It was like the theological civil supreme court made up of 71 religious leader, leaders some of them Pharisees, some of other religious sects. And Nicodemus was one of those. And it was this Sanhedrin. It was this Sanhedrin that would ultimately conspire to arrest Jesus, falsely accuse and condemn Jesus, and ultimately demand that Rome crucify him. And Nicodemus is part of that group of guys. And yet Jesus meets with him. Jesus knows exactly who Nicodemus is. He knows what group he's part of. He knows what that group is going to do. And yet he meets with Nicodemus. And you know why I think he does? I think it's because Nicodemus is earnest. Hebrews 11, we're told that God rewards those who earnestly seek him. This isn't my sermon, but it, but it could be God's word for you. I just wonder if you've ever felt too far away, if you've ever felt like you've betrayed this savior that you once professed your belief in, if you've ever gone too, if you've ever done something so bad that you thought there's no way he could possibly receive me back, then I just want you to hear that message. Now that God rewards those who earnestly seek him in the way that Jesus received Nicodemus back. Jesus is saying to you with his arms wide open, come. You can come back. Would you, before I go just any further, would you take literally five seconds, close your eyes. Do you, is the message for you today, this one, you can come back to Jesus. You know, it's not surprising. It's honestly not surprising to me that Nicodemus came to Jesus. I'll tell you what's really surprising to me personally as I was studying this week was that the whole Sanhedrin didn't come to Jesus. I mean, the Sanhedrin, this theological civil supreme court over all of Israel really had just one role. And it was to lead Israel well until the Messiah came and inaugurated, brought the kingdom of God to the earth. That was their only goal. Lead Israel well and look out for the Messiah, the anointed chosen one foretold by all the prophets who God said would come and rid the world of sin and establish the kingdom of God on the earth. That was their only job. And here you've got Jesus. He's, he's from the line of Abraham, which the Messiah was prophesied to come from the, tri the line of Abraham. Well, so were a million other people that came from that, that line. But he also came from Abraham's son, Isaac, and from, like was prophesied, and from Isaac's son, Jacob, which was also prophesied, and from David, who was the descendant of Jacob. All of these things Jesus fulfilled. It was fulfilled that the Messiah would come and he would heal the lame and the deaf. He would give sight to the blind. He would raise, literally, those who were physically dead back to physical life. 
Jesus did that. The Messiah was prophesied that he would come from Bethlehem and there would be born of a virgin. And that was the whole scandal of Jesus' birth that Mary said, no, I am a virgin. This is from God. All of these things. And yet the Sanhedrin, the one group who was tasked with leading Israel and keeping an eye out for the Messiah, they missed him. Or did they? I mean, when Nicodemus, when Nicodemus comes in verse two, he says this to Jesus. He comes to Jesus at night. He doesn't want the rest of the Sanhedrin to know that he's there. And he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God was not with him. He says three things that the, that the Sanhedrin knows. We know you're from God. We know God is with you and we know it because we know that no one could do what you do if God weren't empowering him. I don't think they missed him. I think they rejected him. And they rejected him because everybody has a choice. It's like we all face this fork in the road of our lives. You do, everyone before us who's ever lived faces the same thing and everyone to come will face the same fork in the road because we have these universal needs that we, that we're, we must meet. Um, the universal need that we feel to be right with God, to feel good about ourselves, to feel loved and to know that we have purpose and that we matter on this earth. Every person alive is born with those needs inside of them and a choice to make in terms of how to meet those needs. And those Pharisees, well, they'd, they'd chosen. They'd chosen to take the Old Testament law, hundreds of, of laws, and, and to expound upon those hundreds of laws and to make a life out of keeping every single one. An enormous checklist of things to do and not to do and, and, and when to do them. Things like on the Sabbath, you couldn't walk more than a certain distance and and you couldn't carry more than a certain weight. And you were supposed to give a tithe, the tenth of everything that you owned. And so they would count out dill, stalks of dill that they had grown. Or they would take a knife and they would take the seed, their cumin seeds. You know what cumin is, right? And they would divide exactly out one, two, oh, there's one more, one tenth of all their seeds to make sure they gave this tithe. And so their life, the way that they had established to feel good about themselves and to convince themselves that they were right with God was to follow all of these religious laws and traditions and customs and cultural mores um, that were, that were set in rules that they and their ancestors had established. And that's what it meant to be a Pharisee. To be a Pharisee meant that you lived according to the rules or you tried to justify yourself by living According to the rules. I just got to admit, I was a Pharisee. I mean, on the inside. I mean, a lot of us have an inner Pharisee, and I certainly did. For years, I thought, I thought that to be right with God, I thought that to, to feel good about myself, to know that I was a good person, I, I had the scale had to tip in my favor in terms of the good things I did versus the bad things that I did. And sometimes it would work, but not every time. And, then, and so whenever you try to live according to the, the rules and try to justify yourself by your words and your actions and to make yourself feel right with God, ultimately because the scale will never always be in your favor, you resort to comparing. So I could always find somebody, I won't make eye contact with him right now. No, I could always find somebody that I was better than. Always somebody who was screwing up in some way that I wasn't. Always somebody who'd done something worse than me. And, and that would make me feel, even though the scale was tipped, even though my, my bad things outweighed my good things or never fully over, uh, overcame, the good things never fully won out, I could always find somebody else that made me feel like, well, their scale is, if my scale is this way, their scale is this way. 
But then I'd look over to the other side and I would see someone else. Oh, and their scale was, was better than my scale. And so I could never find a way through my actions or through comparing to feel good enough about myself. And when you get into that situation, I know for me, there was this, this undercurrent of anger and dissatisfaction with myself began to just grow inside me like mold inside my college refrigerator. And his college refrigerator. And that, that anger, the thing about it, it never stays inside. Those that we love, they feel it. Oh, they may not feel the, the intensity of the condemnation that you feel about yourself or that I felt about myself, but, it, but it, it comes out because when we feel that about ourselves, it just, it leaks. And there was anger and there was impatience and there was a lack of gentleness and there was total dissatisfaction. And, and you know what? That's what it means to be a Pharisee because when you try to live up to the rules and justify yourself in that way, it ain't ever going to work. I had a buddy. I've said this before. I wanted him to come to Crossbridge. He told me he wouldn't come because he's Catholic. And I said, well, heck, you don't ever go to Mass. He goes, doesn't matter. I know I'm a good Catholic anyway. And I said, how do you know you're a good Catholic when you don't go to Mass? He goes, because I always feel guilty. Just saying. That's what it means to be a Pharisee. To never, to never feel good enough. And you know, we can whitewash our pharisaical, the, in, the internal Pharisee, such that people actually are fooled into thinking that we're upstanding or we're worthwhile. They may even praise us. They may even put us in a position of honor. They may reward us in some other way, but it doesn't really matter because that inner Pharisee is never satisfied and you wind up just like I wound up. And you wind up just like Nicodemus wound up. And when you're living like a Pharisee on the inside, you're, you're actually sitting on the throne of your life. It gives you the illusion of being in control because you, because you never feel good unless you do something good. So you feel like you have something you can go after. Even though it's fruitless, it gives you the illusion of sitting on the throne of your life and being in control. So when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, Jesus, everything I've just said about you, Jesus, Jesus knows completely about Nicodemus. And so he cuts to the chase with Nicodemus in verse three. And he says to him, very truly I tell you, Nicodemus, no one can see the kingdom of God until or unless they are born again. When, when Jesus says the kingdom of God, Nicodemus is all ears. He's like, hey, that's, that's my job. My job is to lead Israel well until the Messiah comes and inaugurates the kingdom of God on the earth. You just said the magic words, kingdom of God. And Jesus, but Jesus says, you won't see the kingdom of God. And when he says you won't see it, Nicodemus is thinking, uh, physically, I won't see the citadel of the mighty king hewn out of stone in Jerusalem. But that's not what Jesus means. Jesus, when he says you won't see it, he means you won't perceive it, understand it. He means you won't experience it. You won't enjoy it. Unless you're born again. Now, to you and me, we've heard that phrase a number of times. We may not know exactly what it means, but it's not new to us. But this is the first time ever that that phrase has been used, right here. And so Nicodemus is like, what? You know, he doesn't get it. He doesn't understand. He says to, and so he's thinking purely physical. And he says that in verse four, he says to Jesus, well, how can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus was old. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And just in case you miss the Pharisee's attitude in that right now, he, when it comes to, even when he thinks about being reborn, and of course he has it wrong because he's thinking physical rebirth, he once again puts the burden on himself. 
I mean, like, do you understand? Is there any way I can, I can re-enter into my mother's womb? As if he had entered his mother's womb the first time by some action. None of us has anything to do with our birth. We just receive it. And we are. But Nicodemus is still thinking it's all on his shoulders. Oh, I wish we could see in the spiritual realm the weight that Jesus saw on the shoulders of Nicodemus. Surely, Jesus, they can't enter a second time into their their mother's womb to be born. He doesn't understand, but he's earnest. He's he's like genuine. I want to know. I want to understand what you're talking about. In fact, if you, if you watch this episode, he says this. He's like, Jesus, I want to know. I'm trying to understand. And Jesus sees that. And so he rewards him. He, he tells him more. And in verse five and six, he says, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Now, just as an aside, religious scholars of of today, I mean, really smart men and women, academics, they have a little bit of discussion, disagreement about, okay, what does he mean by water and the spirit? But but I think we can know what he means by verse six. What he's doing, and he tells us this in verse six, is he's drawing a line of, of contrast for Nicodemus saying, there's a difference between the flesh and the spirit. And flesh can only give birth to flesh. It only produces after its own kind. And what he's telling Nicodemus is, you've been working your whole life hard in your own strength, your own flesh, to be right with God and to feel good about yourself. You've been trying to confirm that you, dadgummit, you are a good person and people do like you and you do matter and you've been working hard and where's that gotten you? It hasn't worked. Your flesh has only produced what the flesh can produce. And that is a sense of condemnation, that anger, that impatience, that inadequacy, that feeling of not being good enough, that feeling of being a failure. He says, but Nicodemus, flesh will only give birth to spirit of flesh, but spirit, spirit gives birth to spirit. He's telling him something new. And he's saying to enter into, to experience the kingdom of God, this has to happen. You have to be born of the spirit. To become human, you are born of a human. To become become spiritually alive, you must be born of the spirit. The reason for that. The reason for that is found in Ephesians 2. It's the only verse I'm going to pull, refer to outside of John 3 today. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul describes it for us. He says, you all, because almost every time the Bible uses the word you, it's plural. So were he in Texas, Paul would have said, y'all are dead in your transgressions and sins. And in the way you used to live when you followed the ways of the world. You see, we've all followed the ways of the world. We've, we've chosen not to trust God, but to trust ourselves. Not to follow God, but to follow, to follow the leading of our own flesh. And when we do, we walk away from God. And when we walk away from God, we become separated from him in darkness. And that's what Paul refers to as death. And when we're in this dead place, Jesus is saying, you have to, there needs to be a spiritual rebirth. Your spirit has to be made alive and no amount of work. This is good news, but it may be discouraging news depending on which side of the coin you're looking at. There is no amount of work in the flesh that creates a spiritual rebirth. Nicodemus clearly is still struggling because Jesus says in verse seven, Nicodemus, you shouldn't be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. 
You hear its sound, but you can't tell from where it is going or where it comes from. And so it is for everyone who's born of the Spirit. He's like saying to Nicodemus, don't be, hey, don't be surprised that I just talked to you about a spiritual rebirth. I know it seems like a mystery to you, but in reality, there's lots of things that in the world that God has created that point to him. This is Romans chapter one. It says there's lots of things on the earth that point to the reality of God. And so Jesus chooses the wind. He says, think about the wind, Nicodemus. You don't know where it comes from but you can sense it, right? You actually feel its presence and its power. You don't control it. You don't even know why it's going that direction instead of that direction. But you feel, you recognize and are convinced of its presence and its power. That's what it means to be of the Spirit. It's like yesterday as I was thinking about this very passage, I looked up and have this tra- have some windows in my office and a transom of windows above it. Uh, I guess that's what it's called. And I looked out into the trees in my front yard and they were swaying. Now, if I'd been outside, I would have felt the wind that was moving them. And I've been outside, I would have heard the wind that was moving them, but I wasn't outside. And from the inside, it just looked like they were moving on their own, swaying. Now, I knew it was the wind, though, but I knew that's the wind. The wind is moving them. And even though I can't see it or hear it, I, I know that that's the source of the, the graceful swaying. And the trees don't move themselves. They just respond to the wind. That's part of what it means for to be born of the Spirit. To to respond to the Spirit. To move with the Spirit. To be, even though we cannot see Him, we, we know, we know His reality. We're utterly convinced of His reality just like you're utterly convinced of, of the wind. Jesus is redefining for Nicodemus, what the kingdom of God is all about. It's not about striving. It's about yielding. You hear that? It's not about working harder. He's talking to us Nicodemuses and us Nicodemets. It's not about working harder. It's about surrendering. It's not not about... It's not about trying and striving. It's about responding. It's about getting to know the Spirit as a friend. Sensing, sensing and beginning to discern His spiritual voice, the spiritual whispers of the Spirit coming to you as thoughts and convictions that he impresses upon your mind. It's about knowing him like a father and feeling and feeling right with him. Feeling feeling directed by him and led by him the way a little child wants to be led through the darkness holding their father or mother's hand. It's about feeling provided for. It's about knowing that you know in your knower that you are his and he's yours. And Nicodemus, Nicodemus I think is on the edge here. He's like, he's like on the edge because he's so, he so wants to believe but he's been so entrenched in this pharisaical way of of living. Oh, he wants to be free from guilt. He wants to be free from shame. He doesn't want to have to stuff down his regrets and his remorse and the bitterness from the wounds and offenses that he's experienced from others. He he can sense the life in Jesus, his words. Can you sense the life? Can you sense the life in Jesus, his words? 
And Nicodemus responds in verse nine and he says, how can this be? And he's, he's not questioning the, the credibility of, of Jesus. I think what, the, what he's saying in reality is, tell me how this can be for me. Oh, I wanna enter the kingdom. I wanna know the spirit. I'm so tired. Can you see a man like Nicodemus just being weary? And he's saying, how can it be? Let it be for me. And so Jesus, in perhaps the greatest statement of love of all the Bible, of any word, any parable that Jesus spoke. I'm sure he looked Nicodemus in the eye and said, oh, Nicodemus, God loves the world so much that he sent his only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Believe. Not just acknowledging the existence of something, but to be so convinced of something, to believe it in that deep place such that you say yes to Jesus. You respond, your heart just says, Yes, you, you, you're turned to him to receive whatever it is that he has because you've come to the conclusion, the, the obvious conclusion that everything else that you are trying to get, all the other ways in which you are trying to get it have only led you to where you are. Flesh only gives birth to flesh and nothing ever more than that. And as you turn to Jesus in it is an, in one and the same motion that you are turning away as well from all that the flesh has into all that the Spirit has. You enter into the kingdom of God. You become one born of the Spirit when you receive the King, when you receive Jesus. When you say yes to Jesus, and as you say yes to Jesus, he wraps you up in the biggest of hugs, the most enduring of embraces, and he never lets go. Nothing can snatch you from his hand, and nothing can separate you from his love. Not a thing. And then, you just keep saying yes. Are you born of the Spirit? Have you said yes to Him? Are you living in the kingdom? Are you saying yes to Him? Take a moment. Close your eyes with me. Prayer leaders and life group leaders and elders, please come and take a place for prayer. Today is the day to say yes. Oh, today is the day you can say yes. And maybe it's yes for the first time. Or maybe you're saying yes again starting today. Or maybe there's just an element in your life and Jesus is saying, would you say yes to me in that area of your life? What's your answer going to be? Let it be yes. As we stand and we worship him, there are people that are here that if you need to come for prayer, 
for yourself, or maybe you need to come for prayer for someone else, come forward. If the Lord is saying, oh, you need to say yes, then come and tell this person, I, I, I'm saying yes. Let them pray over you. Let them intercede with you for someone else who's hurting. Maybe come and kneel. There's no carpets today, but your knees can handle it for a while. Just come and kneel. And in that kneeling, say yes. Stand with me now and let's worship him together.
Thank you for joining us today. And as always, reach out to somebody and talk about what God's stirring in your heart. Family member or friend, text or call them. It's so important that we continue to do that. And just a reminder, you can stay up to date with everything going on here at Crossbridge on our website. Well, high schoolers in the room joining us online, we have high school retreat and it's coming January 15th and 16th and the early bird price is going to end on Christmas Eve. So go to ablazeevents.com to register. Dan and I are so excited. We have a lot of really fun things planned for you guys. So be sure to register to get the lowest price. It's gonna be really cool. Also, Passion 2020 is coming up. We're doing it on December 31st. So be sure and sign up on ablazeevents.com. This is gonna be a great time for our high school juniors and seniors, our young adults and college to come together to worship Jesus, to be encouraged by some powerful speaking and then blow some fireworks off in the parking lot at midnight to celebrate the new year. It's going to be awesome. So be sure and join us there. Yeah, Dan and I already signed up, so we're ready. It's going to be a great time. Uh, one thing for you guys to mark your calendars for is our Kid Zone Family Sunday. So on December 27th, our pre-K through fifth will be in service with us. And on January 3rd, our kindergarten through fifth will be in service with us. So be sure to prepare for that for your families. And a reminder for everyone in the church, on December 27th, we're only having our 1015 service. So be sure that you're here at 1015. Um, it'll just be a sweet time of unity that we're all together in one service. So December 27th, 1015. We love you guys. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you soon. See you guys later.